All right. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on our kickoff series for the Hippocampal Subfields Group webinars. We are hoping to build a community by taking this initiative. It's going to be focused on the medial temporal lobe and research um, related to all, all regions and across different populations. So it's not specific to just human work or developmental work or aging work. We want it to be spread across a variety of different um, areas. So the format of this webinar series is that we are going to have speakers join us monthly uh, at the last Wednesday of the month, predominantly at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We have gotten feedback that this doesn't work for everyone, which is why we're recording. Um, but if there are any deviations from this schedule, then we will make sure to announce that in advance. For each webinar, there's going to be one theme. So the theme today is sort of a history and background on the hippocampal subfields group, some progress updates on harmonization efforts, and talking about future steps. Again, with the goal of building a community so that those of you who are not currently a part of the hippocampal subfields group actively can find out ways to, to participate. A few things that I want to note is that we are still finalizing what we're going to be talking about next month. It'll either be neuroanatomy or neurodegenerative diseases. And I want to make sure that everyone who is interested and is aware of presenting at these, we have gotten some volunteers for those of you who have already reached out. Thank you. We have your information down. We won't be able to cover all topics we ask about in this set of webinars, but it helps us to have a feeling for what we can cover in future sessions. So if you are interested, again, we want people from all levels. So trainees across as well as senior uh, personnel. Um, I'm gonna think if I'm forgetting anything. Uh, I don't think so, but again, please reach out if, if you're interested in taking part and know that we will have an update for you soon with a finalized uh, set of lineups. Um, but with that, I wanna again, thank all of you, remind those who are just joining us that we are recording this for YouTube. So if you don't want your face on the internet, please make sure that your cameras are turned off and with that, I'm going to welcome both of our speakers, Dr. David Barron and Dr. Renaud Lejoy. And we're going to start with David covering a progress update and sort of a history, and then he'll be followed by Renaud. If you have questions during this, please utilize the chat box. We'll be taking questions at the end. So we'll have the talks back to back and then at the end, we'll have a time where we use the questions asked in the chat box to have sort of a moderated discussion. And it's very, li very likely that what Renaud talks about will answer some of the questions that comes up in David's presentation. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, David, and stop the sharing of my screen. Great. Thanks, Kelsey, uh, for the introduction and uh, all the organizing work together with Robin. Um, uh, just quickly asking, does everybody see uh, the presenter mode or the full screen? The presenter mode. Oh. Better now? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. So, yeah, as Kelsey said, um, I will basically start uh, giving you a bit uh, of an introduction to the hippocampal subfields group um, and its aim to develop a harmonized protocol for segmenting human medial temporal lobe subregions via MRI. Also a bit on its structure, on its uh, way, how, how, we, how we work and uh, on recent achievements. Um, and then as Kelsey said, Renault will pick that up and give you an idea on what's next. Um, so first of all, for those that are not that familiar with the medial temporal lobe already, uh, the medial temporal lobe is composed of multiple regions with differing uh, anatomy and connectivity, and that includes extra hippocampal regions, such as the anterior, perirhinal, and parahippocampal cortices that can be, for example, subdivided in the case of uh, the perirhinal cortex further in area 36 and 35. Um, and on the other hand, 
um, the hippocampus and its subfields. So this is um, CA1, CA2, CA3, uh, and the dentate gyrus, as you see here on the right uh, on a high resolution MRI slide uh, and on this kind of, of ugly uh, 3D rendering. Um, and again, the entorhinal and uh, the other extra hippocampal regions here. Um, yeah, uh, decades of research actually demonstrate that the medial temporal lobe is uh, critical for cognitive processes such as uh, memory, but also navigation, perception, decision making. Um, and on the other hand, animal research and human postmortem data in particular suggest that hippocampal subfields are differentially affected by age. So that's both true during develop development, but also in old age. Um, that they are differentially uh, affected by diseases such as Alzheimer's disease or, for example, temporal lobe epilepsy, just to name a few. Um, but they are also sensitive to interventions, uh, for example, such as uh, physical exercise. And that actually makes the medial temporal lobe and its subregions a super interesting area uh, for several um, research groups. And there's a tremendous interest in actually measuring the thickness and the volume of these subregions but also to derive regions of interest to, in the end, read out um, any other um, measure from these um, anatomical regions. So for example, activity uh, in an fMRI task. Um, so why is the HSG actually needed? Um, so in order to uh, segment the hippocampus and extra hippocampal regions in smaller subregions on MRI data, um, research groups actually rely on a huge variety of different segmentation protocols that in a huge part also have been developed in these research groups. Um, the problem is that these uh, protocols use different histology references and terminology. So here that might be a bit small, but it's basically from a paper from uh, the HSG that was uh, led by Paul Yushkevich uh, in 2015 where you see a bunch of uh, medial temporal lobe subregional protocols that were available at that time and how they, uh, um, what, what uh, histology reference they use. Uh, and you see several of them uh, use, for example, here the Duvernoy Atlas, uh, but there's also a wide variability of uh, different um, references. Um, and the problem here is also uh, that these uh, references actually rely on a very limited number of cases and do not necessarily report on individual variability. So you usually see one case uh, in these um, references. Um, there's also a difference between the protocols when it comes to the terminology. So that is mostly because of the different grouping uh, of subregions into bigger regions. So for example, there's quite a consistent label that uh, shows up in most of the protocols, which is CA1, uh, or for example, the sabiculum. Uh, but it's already quite different for, for example, the smaller subfield CA2. So some actually group that as a separate label, others group it with uh, CA1, others group it with uh, CA3, and even others then group it with uh, CA1, 3, and the dentate. So this again uh, adds to the uh, differences and variability between protocols. Uh, and in the end, that actually results in uh, different subregion boundary locations. And that you see nicely on uh, that last figure here that is also taken from Paul Juschwitz's paper, uh, where uh, several research groups actually applied their protocol to uh, an identical MR scan of the same um, um, individual. And here you see that there's not only a difference in the resulting label, so they all apply somewhat different labels, but also a difference in the uh, boundaries, actually, where there is the uh, separation between, for example, CM1 and Sibiculum. So um, the HSG actually uh, is also needed because that results in variability that actually hinders the comparison of results and really impedes clinical translation of findings. And here's a nice example. That's a figure that is from Laura Visse. Um, that actually shows you the significant results about uh, subfield volumes and their relationship with age of the participant. Um, and here you see that different studies come to different results. Um, that's maybe not that surprising, um, but we can pick out two in particular. So for example, here is one from our second speaker of the day, Renaud, um, where he finds that the sabiculum is actually significantly associated with age or the sabiculum volume. 
And on the other hand, here, a paper four years later from Laura Visse, uh, where she actually finds CA1 and the dentate to be associated, but not uh, actually cervicular. Um, and um, here, as you see, all the boundaries are exactly the same. So this is what we have in mind when we read or see this research. Uh, but Laura actually went into all these resources and tried to find the boundaries that the researchers have used in these studies. And now you see that there's quite some uh, variability. And if we again focus on the two ones, so the one from Renault and the one from Laura, then we find that there's an area that actually is involved in both of their findings, which is this strip here between cerbiculum and C1, which in Renault's study is called cerbiculum and in uh, Laura's study is called C1. So it might well be that we have a consistent finding here that is actually masked in the variability of the different protocols. So therefore it's actually needed that we come to a harmonized protocol where we call the same group of voxels the same with the same anatomical label. Um, and that's what uh, basically is the aim of the hippocampal subfields group. So we are an international group of researchers that collaboratively uh, develop a harmonized protocol for the segmentation of medial temporal lobe subregions on MRI. And the aim is really to get a validated and reliable protocol that is applicable to populations of variable age and health. Um, so far, the group um, consists of more than 200 members in the broader uh, hippocampal subfields group that spans 20 countries. Um, but to everybody that is uh, new here today, so we're still growing, we're open to everybody, and new members are uh, every time welcome. So just visit our webpage and uh, let us know. So the hippocampus subfields group, when it comes to the structure of the group and how we work, um, consists actually of three main groups. So there's a questionnaire working group uh, that in the beginning um, actually worked on getting a state of the field. So what kind of protocols are we relying on? What kind of sequences are we using? What are we interested in? Um, and that is now actually concerned with designing a questionnaire to ask the broader community about what they think about the first draft of the body protocol that we will be releasing soon, uh, or that the questionnaire will be soon released. Um, then there's a second group, the acquisition working methods group, uh, a methods working group uh, that is actually concerned with identifying uh, the best or uh, most well-suited uh, um, uh, sequences that one can use uh, when one is interested in medial temporal lobe subregions in neuroimaging. And the third group is actually the boundary working group. So the biggest group here and recently most active because it's subdivided in uh, several smaller research, uh, smaller working groups. Um, and all of those are actually coordinated by a steering committee that at the moment has uh, these 12 members that are serving on it. Uh, and there are already uh, three retired members uh, that were founding members and critically involved uh, in the development of the group uh, and all the work um, in the beginning. Um, so the individual groups here in the boundary working group um, are the histology group. So that is uh, con uh, that consists of uh, neuroanatomists that actually help us label uh, histology slices and also provide their feedback in the protocol development. Uh, we have a body ranging group that helped us to define um, the beginning and end uh, of the hippocampal body section in comparison to uh, head and tail. Um, we have a body outer borders pro, uh, group that actually is con or was concerned with defining uh, the borders of the hippocampus towards its neighboring structures. Uh, and we have an inner border working group for the hippocampal body um, that came up with a draft uh, for uh, all the inner boundaries in the body section of the hippocampus. So as you um, realize, most of the work here was related to the hippocampal body. So we have two working groups at the moment that are concerned with the outer bodies of the tail and one that is concerned with the outer and inner boundaries of the head. Yeah, so um, how is the hippocampal subfields group working? Um, so uh, we basically, as you see, are um, structured in small working groups. These small working groups work uh, independently together, mostly uh, remotely, um, and um, yeah, basically then come up with their achievements. Um, but we also have a lot of in-person meetings. Um, so the group was founded um, in 2013, 
Uh, he had a first meeting at UC Davis, then another one in San Diego uh, and Irvine, uh, one 2015 in Chicago. So that was all mostly focused on the body. And uh, overall, you will realize that our meetings actually highly correlate both when it comes to time and location with the bigger meetings. So for example, uh, the meeting of the Society for Neuroscience, so to make it easier for people to attend. Um, most of the uh, meetings in the beginning were actually in the US, uh, but we meanwhile already had two meetings in Europe, uh, one here in London and uh, one in Magdeburg. Um, and then our last meeting uh, was actually in San Diego. And then there was kind of a gap um, in part due to the pandemic. Um, and we're now catching up with the webinar series that you are actually uh, involved in today. So quickly, how um, the protocol uh, development process overall works. So what's the inner logic uh, on how we want to come up with a harmonized uh, segmentation protocol? Um, in step one, we actually collect labeled histology slices uh, from neuroanatomists, and I'll go into detail in the next slides. Um, from that, in step two, uh, we find together in a working group and develop rules for subfield boundaries on high resolution MRI. Once they are established, uh, we, um, uh, they actually uh, for, um, undergo an initial feasibility check when it comes to applicab uh, applicability and um, initial estimates of reliability. Um, and once that is done and once that is um, uh, good enough, um, it is sent out to collect feedback from the broader hippocampal subfields group via questionnaire, and that will circle until we have reached um, a good result. And then uh, in the end, this will all undergo a formal and much bigger reliability analysis. Um, as I said, we do that differently for different sections, so longitudinal sections of the hippocampus. Um, the work for the body is quite progressed, so the outer boundaries have already undergo, um, uh, yeah, undergone all of these steps. Uh, the inner boundaries almost, uh, so the uh, questionnaire here is in progress and will soon be sent out to the broader group. Uh, for the hippocampal head, we have already collected label histology slices um, and the group is already working on the first draft. Um, for the tail, it's a bit different. So we did not collect uh, labeled histology slices because the hippocampal tail has this strong curvature uh, in the MRI, which makes it very tricky to segment subregions. Um, so we here focus, or in the, at the moment, we have a group here uh, focusing on the outer boundaries um, and the initial feasibility check is pending. So quickly to give you a bit more detail on these individual levels of uh, protocol development, um, we have multiple neuroanatomists uh, and we have multiple samples. So, um, sorry, the anatomist that is uh, Gina Gustinak, uh, Son Ling Ding, Olga Kedo and Ricardo and Sausti. And we have uh, three body samples and four head samples. And all samples are actually labeled by at least three anatomists. Um, so that means we can understand the anatomical variability between samples because we have samples from different individuals, um, but we can also um, un try to understand the differences in criteria for subfield borders between the individual neuroanatomists based on the uh, identical slices. And just to give you a bit of a feeling here, oh yeah, and overall the neuroanatomists do not only basically uh, provide us the labeled uh, histology slices, but they're also very actively involved in building the protocol. So that means that they also, uh, whenever it's possible, participate in our group meetings. Um, yeah, to give you an example, uh, here's a sample coronal slice uh, at the level of the body uh, from two different individuals, but labeled from the same um, rater here. Uh, and you see that in these two different cases, the boundary between uh, cerviculum and CA1 is at a slightly different location, um, although the same rules have been applied. Um, and uh, to give you an example of uh, variability across anatomists, so here is exactly the same uh, slice of the same individual, just rated by three individual neuroanatomists. Um, and you see that they um, put the borders between the subregions slightly different. Um, there's maybe a bit more um, coherence between the first two, but then here 
The third, I want to point you to the boundary between the cebiculum and CA1, which is here quite lateral, um, whereas in the two other cases, it's, it's much more medial. Um, and from these sets of, of labeled histology slices, um, we, actually, or we, we actually take these and go then into the group meetings um, to come up with a draft protocol how we can actually capture um, this um, variability uh, in a protocol for uh, that, uh, that, that can be applied to MRI images. Um, so this is yeah, guided by the labeled histology. And our protocol uses MRI image contrast, but also anatomical landmarks and also geometric rules. Um, so we have, the, um, I will not go into the, all the details for all the different rules, but I give you a few examples. So we already have developed a draft protocol for cebiculum CA1, CA2, CA3, and dente gyrus in the body. Um, and for example, especially the subdivision or the, the differentiation between CA3 and dente gyrus is quite tricky. Uh, so here we uh, basically created two options uh, that members then in a the next step can vote on. One is a bit more simple. Uh, I'll quickly introduce you to that. So here we see a, a hippocampal body slice. And as a first step, we would create a, a line from the most um, uh, lateral point um, to the beginning here of the hippocampal fissure. We would then have a dissecting line in the middle. And then we would estimate a 30 degree line and a 45 degree line. And if you have the set of lines, and if you can see uh, the SRLM, he has a hypo intense line in the MR, then you can basically uh, get a subfield cebiculum, CA1, CA2, CA3, and dentate. However, um, this is a bit more simple, but we see that there is a part of the dentate uh, with that more simple rule that is counted towards CA3. So we were wondering whether we can have a bit more complex rule that is a bit more valid. Um, and here's the example of that rule, uh, where we actually, on top of lines one, two, three, that are basically uh, from the left side here, uh, we have another line that goes from the most lateral point of the dente gyrus to the top of uh, the, or the middle of the top of the uh, hippocampus. Uh, then we have another line that goes from the most lateral point of DG and dissects this other line, uh, this, this earlier line in the middle. Uh, and then we have one more line uh, that uh, is again in the middle of that line and um, yeah, dissected or, or, or rests on it. And that actually creates this wedge here um, that would um, in, a, in an earlier test really nicely overlay with CA3. Um, so in the initial feasibility check, uh, that uh, was a bit less reliable, uh, but could be more valid and is more complex. And that's the kind of decision uh, that we then need to make um, after we have sent out the questionnaire. So in step three, as I already said, this will then undergo an initial feasibility check. Um, so here two experienced raters that have been naive to the protocol before training um, but then receive a bit of training for, the pro uh, for this protocol. Um, do actually a segmentation of six brains. Um, they representing varying age, disease stage uh, or diseases, uh, and also a range of image quality. Um, and we assess the inter-rater reliability for all subfields. Uh, and here you see the result of this um, uh, initial feasibility check, uh, where both the ICCs, but also the dice actually ranges in the, in the, um, in the higher end. Uh, so quite pleasing results, maybe with a um, bit of an outlier with the cebiculum here. But as far as I remember, that was uh, actually due to uh, a problem with the outer boundary rule uh, that has been revised. Um, yeah, and then in a, a fourth uh, step, um, this is where we are at, uh, at the moment. Uh, so in spring 21, we're planning to release uh, a questionnaire to the broader uh, hippocampal subfields group with the aim to assess the clarity of each subfield boundary, um, uh, to assess the level of agreement uh, of all groups uh, with each boundary uh, and where people can give their preference for a simple or more complex rule and where they can suggest revisions uh, to the boundaries. And 
this questionnaire and here on the right, we actually have an example of the draft. So just note, this is not finalized yet, um, but this questionnaire actually includes verbal uh, descriptions of the rules. Um, you see actually our suggestion together with the suggestions from the neuroanatomists on uh, a histology slice. You see it on MRI. Um, you have all the initial feasibility results in the text uh, and you have links to quite a rich data set of uh, supporting documentation and, and, and imaging data sets um, to really dive, uh, dive deep uh, to understand that and, and build your own opinion. Um, yeah, and then um, to basically wrap this up, I quickly want to give you a walk through the um, achievements that the group has had so far. That's definitely not all of them, but just for you to get a bit of an idea. Um, so when it comes to the histology, the body histology labeling was already finished and the head histology labeling is finished. Um, we have um, a body outer border protocol finished as well as a body inner border draft of a protocol finished. Um, the questionnaire uh, for the outer borders is already finalized and the questionnaire for the inner borders will be sent out soon. Um, and uh, we have established new working groups. So the tail border group and head border group are most active at the moment. Um, and when it comes to output, we have uh, documented uh, our progress in uh, three publications over the years. Uh, and we could secure um, financial support from uh, JPND uh, in 2016 that helped us to organize um, a meeting. And we have recently uh, secured a grant in Sweden that will help us um, to host uh, um, another conference uh, that will be focused on medial temporal lobe uh, region segmentation. Yeah, and with that, I actually want to close and uh, hand over to Renault. Uh, and just quickly thanking uh, everybody who has and is still serving on the steering committee, all the neuroanatomists involved, uh, the working groups, boundary working group, jet questionnaire working group, and the acquisition working group, and all attendees of um, the group meetings and the broader community. I probably missed some names, um, but this is, yeah, uh, thanks to all of you, actually. David, you have a question in the chat from Menno Witter. Would oh. you like me to read it? Or I, I can let uh, either, either Robin or um, Kelsey read it. Yeah, let's take, let's take that question now because I think that probably isn't something that's focused on uh, in Renault's talk. So the question um, is, are all borders on MRI are based on the line system and are not actually taking the, the real MRI contrast into account. So about um, the, the geometry rules. Maybe I quickly try to jump back to that example. And thanks Rosanna for making sure we were aware. Exactly, um, yeah, man, a really nice question. Um, so uh, the, the lines that we actually establish here are only um, to get the boundaries between regions. But for example, here we use the SRLM to basically guide the overall um, um, yeah, subfield boundaries. So the, the lines here really just give us the, um, yeah, the, 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 these, these short boundaries basically here between CA1 and CA2 and CA2 and CA3. Um, but otherwise, we rely on, on image contrast and, and other landmarks. Um, I hope this answers the question. So it's both. Yes, thanks very much. But uh, it's something that I would like to discuss further at some point, but there's no reason to continue now, but it's clear for now. All right, if we don't have any pressing questions, we'll hold any others that pop up in uh, the head. So maybe Tracy's question We'll, we'll hold at the end about age ranges and uh, I'll turn it over to Renaud right now and we'll come back to that question after, after he's finished. All right, thank you everyone. Um, can you see the, can you see what you're supposed to see or the presentation mode? You're, you're good. Okay, 
<laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm really glad to be here today. And I think um, I'm really excited about this new webinar series we're starting. I'll be talking a little bit more about this uh, later. Just want to say that I'm, um, I've, I've been working with the uh, group for uh, quite a few years now, and uh, and I'm really excited that we're um, we're doing um, we're implementing all these new things. So my my, my talk is really uh, following up on what David showed, and I think I'm going to talk about what's going on right now, what's uh, what we hope is going to happen in near future, and I'm really going to insist in in a not subtle way. I have to uh, be upfront about uh, you know what we're doing, what we're hoping to do, and. Uh, where people can actually contribute, uh, where uh, people uh, might actually um, be welcome to volunteer if anyone wants to um, uh, be part of any of the things that I'm going to talk about. So um, I, I think, you know, David showed this figure already before, it's slightly modified here, just want to give a little uh, update on all, um, all of the current things. Um, so, um, first of all, um, you know, talking about the, the body um, um, protocol, uh, David mentioned this. I just want to um, make it clear that we're about to send a questionnaire to the whole um, uh, list, email list, to get their people feedback. And um, I want to emphasize that this is a very, um, uh, you know, this is the first time we actually issue a, a full uh, protocol development um, for a, a part of the medial temporal lobe. And this is really a, a, a huge effort that um, Anna, actually, Anna Dougherty uh, led. And you'll see that it, this is not just a little questionnaire to respond. There's also a 75 page document to justify and explain all the rational between um, all the different options we had. And that also includes um, example tracing videos um, uh, to show um, actually um, how the um, protocol would work on, on a real MRI. So that is for the body. Um, David already talked about this. Um, now, talking about the hippocampal head, uh, you know, uh, we um, already collected for a histology sample, like David said, and actually we worked on um, um, this um, part of the hippocampus in previous in-person meetings uh, when that was still a thing. Uh, and so we, we worked quite a lot on this. Of course, the head is a very complicated structure. Um, so it took us quite a while to figure out how to approach it and actually to gather the really amazing histology data that um, is so crucial for what our group is trying to do. So just to give you an idea, similar to what David was showing, you know, here I'm showing you one sample. Um, um, so the top row is uh, the same exact slice segmented by three different anatomists. And the uh, bottom row is the same sample, but just uh, a more posterior slice of the of the hippocampal head. Uh, you can see that we got, um, of course, the anatomist um, here it's blinded, but they all um, segmented their um, the slices based on high resolution images we provided them, and um, um, really completely blind to uh, what the others were doing. Again, what we're trying to get here is not only the variability of, of the anatomy across people, but also um, really trying to make sure of what we can be confident to call CA1 and subiculum just based on the histology data. I'm not even talking about MRI here. So trying to find regions of agree agreement and disagreement between anatomists. So this is a sample one. Uh, this is another sample. Here it's same thing. Uh, each column is a different rater um, and um, each uh, row is a different level in the hippocampus head. Um, so I, I won't go into the details also because this is uh, at, a more, at an earlier stage that what David was showing about the um, uh, uh, hippocampal body, uh, but you, you can see how rich this data is. And I think this is again, something that will make um, our protocol something um, very unique in that we, we really gathered a lot of um, 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 anatomy data to, um, com to, to create this uh, protocol. Um, so actually what we ended up doing in the previous in-person meetings working on this uh, section of the hippocampus is to divide the section into three. Uh, first, the most interior section. So we actually came up with a lot of um, words that don't really, I'm, I'm not sure they're gonna stick around because they don't really sound super scientific. Scientific, so like the most interior part of the of the hippocampus um, is a bean shaped or a digitized bean. When we can see some digitation starting here, and I think the reason why we separate this from the rest is that this, um, you know, overall um, um, 
microscopic organization of the hippocampus is always associated with just subiculum and CA1 being present in no other subfield. Um, and um, here in this um, like midsection of the head, we um, have across all different anatomies and different atlases, um, like still this digitations um, um, uh, and also the appearance of the dentate gyrus um, uh, below the digitation or in, in the meat of the digitation really. Um, and then the posterior section is, um, is a, a little different again, because it has some kind of like a body like shape uh, where uh, you can, if you, if you would ignore, um, I'm going to use the laser pointer here. If you could ignore this part here, everything else looks like the hippocampal body. So we, we hope to um, use the rules that uh, David described already. And then uh, we're trying to figure out what to do with um, the uncus here or the uncle island when it's, uh, when it looks uh, detached from the rest of the hippocampus. Um, and so again, like in the process of working on this and developing this uh, protocol, um, it was always a back and forth between looking at all the different histology samples we had uh, segmented by different anatomists and also looking at, you know, uh, trying to be realistic about what's feasible with imaging data, looking at actual um, uh, three uh, Tesla MRI uh, data um, gathered um, across groups to see what uh, would um, uh, be feasible and what we think are reliable. I think going back to the question that uh, was asked before, you know, we're trying to make it clear that we're not just trying to make, um, um, uh, to de design rules that would be uh, purely based on geometrics. Uh, we're really trying to find actual macroscopic landmarks in the images that can guide these uh, geometric rules. So it's it's kind of a mix always of, of um, uh, things that we can actually see in the image contrast and um, and kind of general uh, geometric rules of um, organization. Uh, what um, came out of these meetings is a document that gives like, for example, this is a, an example for the most posterior part of the hippocampus. Um, we came up um, like the, the working group came up with uh, different propositions on how to deal with how to segment. Of course, this is done like completely manually. This is just a, like a, really a rough draft. But um, again, every time looking at both the um, anatomy data and the actual MRI and trying to uh, think about different kind of rules that could be applied, both um, again, based on geometrics and, and, and the actual data. And so um, uh, multiple rules have been issued for um, all the different sections. And uh, what we hope to uh, accomplish next is um, to assess these propositions and evaluate their feasibility both on MRI and on the new um, anatomy uh, data set, because we work with three of these data sets and now we have four. So we want to um, assess these um, uh, propositions on the new one. And um, the goal in the end will be to write a document um, just like we did for the body uh, to um, justify all the, all the choices we uh, made and the proposition we're making. And so this is gonna be um, dealt with by a, a new working group um, that's partly independent from the previous one. And um, I also want to issue a call for volunteers. Um, so if anyone wants to join this effort, um, I think we're about to start. So uh, now would be a good time to join. And I think for this specific task, task we're um, looking for people who already have experience on manual segmentation of MRI or neuroanatomy uh, to kind of uh, join the, um, the, this working group. Um, for the tail, uh, David talked about this. Um, uh, there was an agreement in the working group meetings that the current um, available MRI data would not um, allow to uh, visualize inner structure of the hippocampus and would not uh, be because again of the curvature of the, of the hippocampal tail. Um, so uh, no one felt like the, the data we're looking at the three Tesla MRI would allow um, to uh, um, Pro, um, provide landmarks for um, a, a good segmentation of subtils. So the protocol will be limited to like a, a, a precise definition of the outer boundaries of the hippocampal tail. And um, as far as I know, um, uh, the protocol has been already written and we're um, like the, the working group is um, currently revising the uh, latest uh, version. Um, here, uh, you, you know, uh, well, the, the group is called hippocampal subfields, but we, um, are hoping to be a little bit more ambitious than this. And, and here, uh, one thing that is not on this graph is actually um, all the cortical areas of the medial temporal lobe. Uh, 
Um, we haven't worked on this yet, and uh, we're really focusing on the hippocampal subfields now, but we hope to um, expand our work uh, on um, uh, per hippocampal areas. Um, but again, um, uh, we will need uh, working groups to um, complete this task. Um, and last point I want to make is that all the current protocols uh, we're designing are designed for three Tesla MRI, which is the most um, available um, and definitely um, widely used for um, hippocampal um, um, research. Uh, but uh, we could also think about um, how our protocols could be adapted to be um, used for high resolution data, uh, maybe at 7T with a better um, in-plane and, and, and uh, resolution and, and slice thickness uh, that could help us get more and more information. So, you know, th these um, group would not start from scratch because we already have, again, uh, the labeled um, uh, high resolution histology data. But in the um, design of the segmentation rules, uh, I think this um, uh, work groups could work on, um, on refining the rules. Um, so for all of this, uh, of course, uh, we will need people to um, um, uh, volunteer and work on this. And we're hoping that you know what we've um, what we've done so far will be the start of like a, a more general framework to uh, design these um, segmentation protocols. Um, um, a word on, on founding. Um, I think most of the work that we've done over the years has been um, pro bono and really um, we got a, a funding from um, the a European um, agency, JPND, uh, to organize a couple of meetings in, in person. And Laura Wieser and David Barron just got more money from um, Sweden to organize this uh, group meeting. So we hope that um, in the near future, uh, we'll be able to have in-person meetings um, just because this is really in our experience what really helped us um, make the most progress and you know look at um, slices together and and draw lines and draw uh, vaguely uh, resembling um, hippocampal um, slices on the whiteboard and work on this. Uh, we're also working on 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 our one um, submission to um, really dedicate more time and effort to this work. And then the last point I want to make is that our current goal is really, um, I think, especially in the last year with the pandemic and the, and the global situation, we've really um, realized that we wanted to um, be part of building this community of scientists. We want to um, be able to share the knowledge that we've acquired and that all our members um, um, have. Uh, we would like to provide um, education material for uh, new trainees and new researchers joining the field. Uh, and really um, have a platform to um, share and communicate new results. Um, like I said, we're also trying to uh, involve new people into our current work. Um, and this is not completely innocent. We also um, really realize that the outcome of our work uh, will only be meaningful if it's widely known and adopted. So um, we're hoping to involve as many people on the way. And for this, we have uh, this website um, that uh, probably most of you know. Uh, if you want to contact us, there's uh, a couple of links here to join the mailing list or to email us directly. Uh, I think we also created, uh, actually, uh, a little bit um, less than two years ago, a Twitter account that's pretty active. And I think what's really been uh, very helpful is um, the weekly thread of uh, Subfield Wednesday that uh, Rosanna Olson has really um, uh, been leading. And this is just a way to share um, kind of educational uh, or um, material or to discuss controversies in the field. It's really uh, been active. And um, all the um, different threads um, can be found at this link where there's like a, a very nice way to um, summarize all the, and to, to read all the threads at once uh, um, instead of having to scroll through Twitter. Um, and again, here, we're uh, very happy to get contribution from people. Uh, to get suggestions about uh, topics that they want us to talk about or that they are confused about and that they would like us to um, clarify. I, I think this has been a very good uh, way to engage um, scientists. And of course, there's this webinar series that we're starting today. Um, again, it's recorded and it will be posted on YouTube. Um, we are hoping today is really the, the, the first session and it's a special one. We just wanted to introduce ourselves to a lot of um, new um, uh, researchers and trainees. Uh, but in the future, we hope to have people come and present their work. Um, 
And we're, we're really aiming at like a flexible format uh, and content. Uh, we're um, happy to get uh, volunteers to present their work, whatever kind of duration or uh, type of research they want to uh, tell us about. I think that would be a very nice platform to um, just uh, give opportunities to, to interact um, um, as we would potentially have uh, in, in conferences. Um, so on, on that note, I will um, show this slice again. This slide again, we're um, really excited by um, you know, everything that we've done and everything especially that we will be doing. And uh, we really hope to uh, get together again because these meetings have been really exciting and, uh, and really uh, scientifically um, rich. Uh, so thanks for your attention and I think now we can we can take some questions. Thank you, Renaud and, and David uh, for kicking us off. Uh, really excited and again, thank you all for joining us. Um, so now we have some time to, to answer any questions. I'll circle back to the question that uh, Tracy Riggins asked um, based on the slide that Laura had shared with David and it was showing those variations in age-related differences or age-related findings in subfields, even when using um, similar boundaries. So I, this comes from the fact that I think Tracy it was, is, was my PhD advisor and she's a developmentalist. Um, so could you answer the age ranges that were included in that comparison slide and maybe more broadly, the goal of having a protocol that is applicable across the lifespan? So I'll let either of you answer that question. Yeah, well, um, I, you know, I, I think uh, <laughs> maybe Laura, uh, you know, um, uh, could contribute as well if, if she wants to. Um, don't want to steal like this is an amazing figure, and I don't want to steal any um, any glory from from her on this. Um, you know, I, I think the point was really to talk about the um, the differences in segmentation protocols and how they might affect results. But there's definitely a lot of um, um, you know, when you're thinking about the effect of age, there's a lot of uh, just methodological issues that are, go beyond the hippocampal um, um, segmentation protocol, including the cross-sectional versus longitudinal design and the age range, because looking at aging between, you know, the lifespan versus um, aging after 60 years old is definitely different. Um, I, I think um, including in the, you know, the, the example that David um, choose comparing uh, my, my results and, and Laura's, I think it was um, comparable in that we're looking at uh, across the lifespan, I guess, uh, like young uh, adult versus older adults. Uh, but this is definitely um, like a, an issue, like the, the, the discrepancy between all the results cannot be only attributable to uh, differences in segmentation protocols. And back to your question also about what kind of, um, 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 you know, tr tr trying to develop a protocol that will be um, useful for everyone. We have been trying to get um, samples, especially you know how our um, anatomy histology data, and trying to get um, a little bit of variability in the age range. I think one of our cases is also a patient with uh, some degree of Alzheimer's disease to make sure that you know there's no big um, a confounder here. Um, I, I don't know if David, you 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 have this demographic characteristics more in, more in mind. I'm I'm not sure. No, sorry, I have to pass on that one. Uh, no, but there are there are kids included for sure as well. Data from children. Thank you. Thanks, Noah. Yeah, Noah participated to most of our group meetings. So, you know, there's a lot of people. Um, I just want to say that uh, David and I are presenting today, but there's a lot of people that could have given these talks because a lot of people have been involved in multiple uh, steps of this process. And it's really been a, a huge um, effort, group effort. Great, thank you. Um, so we have another question that is probably applicable to a handful at least of people who are joining us today. It's from Frederick and it's talking about uh, people who are joining us today who may not have a great deal of experience with hippocampal subfields and asking where the group suggests people start in training and what they should focus on learning. And if those who may necessarily don't have a good amount of experience and being frustrated by these questions um, can still contribute to the group. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, 
uh, we, we all have started at some point and in the beginning all looks very fuzzy and it takes a, a while until all makes sense. Um, so I, I, I definitely would recommend starting with the uh, anatomical papers on the medial temporal lobe and looking into the um, um, uh, protocols. Maybe we can also provide an overview um, to people on our web page. I'm not sure whether we have that already. Um, but apart from reading, um, there's also, and I think that should not be missed, uh, a YouTube um, lecture series, basically, or tutorial series uh, that has been done by Laura Visse, actually, where she explains um, how to segment um, medial temporal lobe subregions on MRI. Um, so that is definitely something uh, people um, can check out in the beginning. And I would be, I would have been very happy if I would have had that resource when I started. Yeah, I think, you know, I, like, th thanks a lot for the question, because I think this is kind of what we're trying to get to uh, here. We're really, you know, like, I think a, a lot of us that are in the steering uh, committee kind of started in the field when it was um, starting or when it was still like uh, at it, like at a very early stage. So it was kind of easier to get on board. And now I have to admit that there's a lot of protocols going on. There's a lot of things. Um, what we um, are really trying to um, do here is to really plat provide a platform for people to learn. And so I think we will need to also know exactly what people want to hear about. And this is where we're like really welcoming feedback about, you know, what people are confused by and what people would like to know. I think Rosanna's um, um, Twitter threads have been really helpful for many people to clarify some terms or understanding some controversies in the field that can, you know, could take months to uh, figure out if you're trying to look through PubMed. Um, but we're really, um, you know, if people are willing to tell us exactly, like more specifically things they, they would like to um, know about, I think we, we could also work on this. I think we've talked about having like an anatomy um, Kind of uh, lecture uh, in in the near future. We'll, we're we're working on this. Um, I think everything is a little slow with with the current world state. Awesome, thank you. I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Um, but oh, there is one. So in terms of histology, is anyone looking at whether the use of clarity could provide additional information for the segmentations? And as I read this, I also wanna say that if anyone else who's a part of the hippocampal subfield steering committee or group wants to chime in, I'm sure Renault and David would not be opposed based on our other conversations. <laughs> Well, so just to, to address that that question uh, clearly, uh, uh, we haven't considered considered that yet. We're, um, uh, you know, uh, we've been trying to um, ask um, anatomists to um, segment their uh, slices, the slices uh, based on their own um, kind of uh, method uh, that they feel comfortable with and, and that they've been using. But um, you know, this could be something in the future that will definitely be. Um, that we want to improve and that we want to, um, you know, I, I don't think we're limited in our goals and in our in the methods that we're uh, hoping to use, uh, but it will definitely take um, people with expertise in this domain, uh, domain uh, and, and I don't think any of us uh, has it for now. But again, we've been like, I, I think one of the key things in, in the whole process has been like a very close collaboration and ongoing conversation with, um, experts across fields and including people not doing imaging and doing anatomy and histology. So um, if you know anyone, um, let us know. Are there any other questions that people wanna pop in the chat? Otherwise I would ask if there's any other comments that again, members of the, the group that is also those that could have given this talk or who have contributed um, want to add, I'd, I'd open it to you in our last couple of minutes, just so that um, we can make sure that Robon, myself, Renaud, and David didn't miss any important points as we as we kick this off. If not, <laughs> I'll just quickly in this last. 
Sorry. There's one more question. Yeah. I think there's a question on MR sequence parameters for 7T protocols. Um, so so I, we, I don't think we have a, a recommendation that we, that we can send out or that the acquisition working group has been working on. Um, but uh, I'm happy to share what, what we use usually um, and, and, and discuss. So just uh, send me an email. David, there might be actually some suggestions on, I'm gonna just really quickly look on the hippocampal subfields website. There might be a page that has some um, recommendations. And if there is, then I will throw it in the chat Thank really you. quick. Um, but- I let's... already have it pulled up, Rosanna. I can oh, okay. copy paste. Okay, you beat me to it. I've... Oops. <laughs> I did it too, but <laughs> I think there's a few more, maybe a few more questions. Yep, it looks like a few trickled in. Um, oh, and a long one. Oh, there, oh, okay. <laughs> had to scroll up. Uh, so the first of the, the trickle in questions is regarding the fact that most of the development of these protocols have been based on cellular atlases. And the question is whether more information might be gained from including white matter staining in the development. This is, I'm just gonna go on a limb and say, this is probably similar to the question that Renault gave regarding clarity and that that's not something currently represented as an area of expertise among the group, but that there's no sort of limit on the creativity or the advances that the group is, is interested in making. So if you know someone or if you have suggestions, that'd be something that I'm going to say we'd be more than happy to, to discuss and, and hear some more about. Yeah, and I, I guess I would just say that the, you know, the body protocol that we're about to send a questionnaire about is probably not going to change at this point by these, um, these are very useful suggestions, but at this point we have to kind of use the technology that's available to us now and hopefully have this harmonized protocol um, be approved and, um, and disseminated sooner than later. But that's not to say that there couldn't be a hippocampal harmonized protocol 2.0 um, if it's the case that with advances in technology, including some of the methods that were brought up here, um, couldn't be implemented in a future version. I agree. And I think it, this is kind of like, by, like, I think right now we're also very limited by the resolution of the imaging that we're trying to segment. And that um, improving the atlas in and of itself would not necessarily, like the histology atlas, would not necessarily be a huge uh, help for what we're trying to do on, on the 3T data. I think things are going to be very different when we uh, get to higher resolution imaging, where we can actually get more information from the images uh, and that we can have more landmarks that are reliable. Um, and at that point, I think anything that can improve our uh, understanding of, of the anatomy would be super helpful. Okay, and this the last question was, whether there will be separate protocols required for males versus females. And my understanding at this time is that no, this is just trying to have a diverse representative sample of different images across the lifespan and from different groups that can be applied um, reliably to both males and females. But I will let someone else clarify if needed. If Laura, if Laura is um, able to speak to the, um, the histology samples that we have, I believe at least for the head, we have both males and females represented in our, um, in our Atlas data set that the histologist traced on. Um, and if Laura is able to confirm that, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The histology data is, as far as we were able to do it, uh, representative of both sexes and the MRI data set, of course, as well. But that was a little bit easier to achieve, of course. Thanks. All right, well, we are one minute over time, but I'm gonna give us a pat on the back for staying pretty close to on time. Uh, and I just wanna thank all of you again for joining us today. We're looking forward to having all of you be a part of this community. And again, I will 
uh, echo the point that please, if you're interested in being a part of this uh, webinar or just as a part of the group more broadly, reach out. We are happy to have more people, especially in this digital time where we see each other mostly on computers and we can facilitate collaborations and interactions more easily. Um, so if you need to go back, we're gonna put this on our YouTube as soon as my computer allows me to. Uh, but if not, we will see you on Twitter and we will uh, send you an announcement and update about the next webinar series. So thanks everyone.